Now, if you take out your message notes, I want to begin with a fundamental truth about you. You are not just a body, okay? You're not just a body. You're far more than just your physical frame. Your body is very important, but you have a soul and you have a spirit. Now, the world only focuses on your body and your mind, but God also cares about the development of your soul and your spirit. And that's why he puts you on earth, to develop your spirit and your soul before you're ready for eternity. I talk about in Purpose Driven Life that life is a test and life is a trust and life is a temporary assignment before eternity. And God has five purposes for you here while you're on this planet. Now, the Bible talks about these five purposes in details, and I even wrote about them in The Purpose Driven Life. But attached to those five purposes for your life are five deep emotional and spiritual needs, your five deepest emotional and spiritual needs. Now, next weekend, I'm gonna go deeper in explaining these, so don't worry about writing this down. It's just a little sneak preview. But all five of these needs that God placed in you can only be met by full participation in God's family. God's family, the church, is the tool that God created to meet your deepest needs. So what are they? Well, your deepest emotional and spiritual needs are you need spiritual support and stimulation. You need, number two, you need spiritual strength and stability. Number three, you need an empowering sense of awe which actually comes from connecting with the supernatural and with the sacred in a relationship with God. Number four, you need self-worth and self-expression. Those go together. And finally, you need to feel significance and satisfaction. Now, these five deepest emotional and spiritual needs are connected to God's five purposes for your life, but you cannot fulfill them by yourself. You will never satisfy them by yourself. You can try, but you'll fail. Only by being connected to God's family will these needs ever be met in your life. Now, first, just like a brand new baby needs family to care for it, a baby can't care for itself. You need to first embrace and connect with the spiritual family that gives you spiritual support and spiritual stimulation. In other words, you need both comforting, sometimes you need comfort, and you need challenging. Sometimes you need to be challenged to get off your rear end and get moving. And you need these from other people. Now, the Bible calls this connection fellowship and membership in the body of Christ. That's your first and deepest need. You need a family that's gonna give you support and stimulation. Number two, you need to establish a solid worldview, and I'll explain this in the weeks ahead, that gives you a spiritual strength, gives you the spiritual strength and stability that you're gonna have in the storms of life. Life is tough. And uh, you have to know how to handle life and how to handle all of the trauma and the tribulations and the trials that come at you. And you gotta be spiritually strong for that. Now, how do you grow spiritual strength? Well, the answer is only by being spiritually stretched. You grow strong, just like a muscle can only grow stronger by being stretched, your spirit and your soul must be stretched in order to be strengthened. That's part of my job. And the Bible calls meeting this need in your life, the need for spiritual strength, discipleship. Number three, you need to experience the sacred and the supernatural power of God in your life. And what that does is it gives you a sense of awe. You need a sense of awe in your life. If you don't have any awe in your life, you're bland, you're boring, and you're probably not very happy in your life. Now, what is awe, a sense of awe? Awe is a mixture of emotions. It combines reverence and wonderment for something greater than yourself. Have you noticed that human beings are naturally attracted and drawn to awe-inspiring sights? We, we, we go see them on vacation. We're, we're naturally attracted, drawn to awe-inspiring sights and awe-inspiring sounds and awe-inspiring experiences and awe-inspiring feelings. We love the feeling of awe. We love being awed. Why? Because we instinctively know that there's something or someone out there that's greater than we are, and that is no accident. Have you ever thought about it? Why is it that every single culture in the world worships? Every single culture worships because you're wired for worship as a human being. You can't help it. The fact is you're wired for worship and if you don't worship God, 
You're gonna worship something. You might even worship yourself or your boat or your career or, an, uh, or a celebrity, but you're gonna worship something because we're wired for worship. Now, it's a paradox. I want you to listen to this that without awe, which is worship in your life, without awe in your life, your life becomes awful. That's paradox. Without awe in your life, your life becomes awful. But on the other hand, with awe in your life, if you regularly experience moments of awe in your life, your life becomes awesome, awesome. And awe comes from the sacred, that's called worship. A fourth need that you have in your life, a fourth deep need is express your spiritual gifts in service. And that's what gives you self-worth. You need to feel good about yourself. You need self-worth and you need self-expression. Now, notice, I haven't said a word about success because status and salary and success do not give you self-worth. But self-expression of being what God made you to be does. Let me say it another way. You need a place to shine. You need a place to sparkle. You need a place of self-expression that is essential to your spiritual and emotional health. And when people don't have a place to shine or sparkle and to express the shape, the God-given spiritual gift, heart, ability, personality, experiences that God gave them, then you, you get bored with life. Starting out, you need a safe place to discover and to develop your spiritual gifts and your shape. Now, I want you to listen. You, you can develop your natural talents anywhere. You can develop them on a football field if you're talented in that area. You can develop them at work. Uh, you can develop the natural talents, which by the way, God gave you those two, anywhere. But you can only discover the spiritual gifts that God has put inside you and given you. The only place you can discover that is in a church family because that's where God gives them Spiritual gifts are given out through his family and that's where he expects you to use them. And if you never discover your spiritual gifts, the one, you say, I don't even know that I've got gifts. Oh yeah, you do. The Bible talks about them a lot. But if you never discover them, it's a huge loss, not only here on earth, but in the rewards that you're gonna miss in eternity. You know, it's another paradox of life that I said that without awe, your life is awful, but with awe, your life becomes awesome. It's also true that in your life, that self-respect and self-worth, listen, come through selflessness. Self-respect and self-worth actually come through selflessness, not by focusing on yourself. It doesn't come by focusing on yourself, but, but self Self-worth comes by focusing actually on serving others. God wired the universe in that only as you give your life away does your life have success of, uh, of self-worth and self-awareness. Uh, uh, Finally, the fifth need that you have in your life is that you need to know your God-given mission, and that gives you significance and satisfaction. You're not put on this planet by accident. Now, the way that this series is going to work, because we're gonna cover all five of those deep needs in your life in the next five weeks. The way this series is gonna work is that in my weekend teaching, I'm gonna primarily focus on why you have these five deep needs in your life and why you need a church family to meet them and why only the church can meet those needs. Business can't, government can't, school can't, boyfriend can't. We're gonna talk about the why on the weekend. Now, today, I want you to see how you need other people in your life. You need a church family for spiritual health. I know I'm belaboring this point, but because all the time we hear people say, oh, I love God, I love Jesus, I just don't need a church family. That's nonsense. It means you have no idea all of the gifts, the blessings, and the benefits God has prepared for you when you're fully involved in his family. Now, let me just say it this way. Today, all around the world, people are taught to act as if they don't need anybody else. We're told, do your own thing, go your own way, be your own man. We idolize the rugged individualist who goes off by themselves on a mountain and seems to have no need of anybody else. And we think, man, they are, they're totally independent and, and, and we idolize that independence. In fact, in today's culture, quote, depending on anybody else is often considered to be a weakness. 
and you're, you're, you're never supposed to let on that you, they need anybody else. And people often characterize marriage as like it's a prison, limiting your options when actually, when God is at the center of your marriage, marriage is not limiting, it's liberating. It actually makes you twice as effective than you would be by yourself if you have a godly, God-centered marriage. True love, healthy relationships, real community, and genuine fellowship, they bring out the best in you. In fact, you can't become all God wants you to be without other people in your life. You need them for your spiritual and emotional health. And when you have those kind of close relationships in a church family, it makes you far, far better than you'd ever be on your own by yourself. The fellowship of belonging to a church family, the community, like here at Saddleback Church, has liberated and emancipated and brought out the best in literally tens of thousands of people just in this church, Saddleback Church. And by being a part of this family, it's helped them become greater and go farther and accomplish more and be happier and, and even live longer than people would have ever lived or experienced on their own. Did you know the studies show that if you go to church, you're gonna live on an average about five to six years longer than other people if you're in church every weekend? Now, you know, I've heard people say, complete independence is the key to happiness. Complete independence is happiness. Well, let me be completely honest with you because after counseling thousands of people, I can tell you this, that's nonsense. Complete independence from other human beings is not happiness, it is loneliness. It is loneliness. And the quickest way to make yourself completely miserable and resentful and fearful and insecure and unhappy is to pretend that you have it all together and you don't need anybody else in your life and that you're completely independent of needing anybody else's help. Not only is that idea a lie, it's simply not true, but it's verifiably stupid. It's dumb, it's provably absurd, and everybody around you knows it's not true. And yet, we persist in wearing masks and pretending that we're self-contained and that we're not dependent upon each other. Now, you know what's really ironic to me? I'm, a, I'm an observer of human behavior as a pastor. I had to fly to Washington, D.C. and back, and we were in a couple airports. I just watch people. And what's ironic to me is to watch how we desperately want and need the attention of others and the approval of others and the affirmation of others and even the affection of others. We desperately in need want these things. We just don't want to admit how badly we need it. And that's why everybody wears emotional masks instead of being authentic with their true needs. What we've been taught is that happiness comes from independence, but the truth is real happiness comes from interdependence. God wired us that way, and he wants us to be a part of his family. In Genesis 2.18, the very first thing God said to man was this, it is not good for man to be alone. Now, whether you ever get married or not is irrelevant to that verse. It is not good for you to be alone. God says you need a spiritual family. And in another very important Bible verse, God says in Romans 12, verse five, since we're all one body in Christ, we, we're all in the family of God, we're all in the body of Christ, we're all a part of his flock, we notice this, we belong to each other. Circle that word belong. We belong to each other and each of us needs all the others. In a church family, you don't just belong to Jesus, you belong to each other. You're my brother, you're my sister, I'm your brother, I'm your sister, and the Bible says we need each other. Now, now you may not feel this is, you feel this. You don't necessarily feel like you need other people. You may not feel like you belong, but it is absolutely necessary. God says being a part of a, of a member of God's family, a community, a fellowship, is not optional. A, a Christian without a church family is a spiritual orphan. You know, years ago, many of you remember when we did 40 Days of Purpose, about 35, 36,000 churches in just America alone did 40 Days of Purpose. And in that series, I shared the big idea that God created you to fulfill five purposes on earth. But in this series, I wanna share an even bigger idea. And the bigger idea is this, you cannot fulfill God's purposes for your life by yourself, on your own. 
you need other people. And each week, we're gonna look at a different purpose and a different emotional and spiritual need that you have and how God wants to meet that need in your life. Now, what I want to do today for the rest of our time together is just quickly give you five reasons you need a church family for your spiritual and emotional health. You cannot be healthy unless you're connected to other believers in the body of Christ, in the family of God. So write these down. Number one, first thing I need is this. I need others to walk with me. I need others to walk with me. That's one of the benefits of a church family. You know, the Bible often calls your spiritual life your walk, your spiritual walk. And the Bible says walk in love, walk in truth, walk in lightness, walk in joy. Colossians 2, 6 and 7 says, just as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Now, why does God compare life to a walk? Because it's a journey. So I said, we're to walk in light and love and truth and obedience. We're to walk in the spirit. We're to walk like Jesus. God never intended for you to walk through life alone. Now, as I said, this has nothing to do whether you're single or married. Thousands of singles fully walk in the Lord in the community and the fellowship and the family and the membership of Saddleback Church. He said, well, what's wrong with walking alone? I prefer walking alone. <laughs> Well, let me give you three benefits of walking with others in a church family. You might just write this in your margin there or whatever. Number one, it's safer. There's safety in numbers. There's less risk. You ever had to walk through a dark alley at night by yourself when you preferred, would have preferred to have walked with somebody else? When you're going through dark times, it's safer to walk with others. Number two, it's supportive. It keeps you from giving up. If you've ever done a marathon and you get a pain in your side and you're tempted to quit, it kicks in for you, you know, probably, uh, I don't know what, what mile, maybe for me about, you know, yard 50. <laughs> and, and, but, but when you run with other people, it, it, it keeps you going. It gives you support. You know, there's an old African proverb that says, if you want to run fast, run alone. But if you run, 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 want to run far, run with other people. When you run together, you can go so much farther. That's why geese fly in V formation, so they don't get tired. The the updraft carries the others along, and they change out who's at the front of the V. So it's safer. It's more supportive. It's smarter. You actually learn more by walking with others through life. Proverbs 28, 26 says this, only fools trust what they alone think. You know, if you're walking alone, you might be walking in the wrong direction. The Bible says in the multitude of counselors, there's safety. One of the things you learn when you're walking with other people is you learn how to get along. You learn how to love. And one of the great goals of life is learning how to love because God is love. Well, when you walk with others, it teaches you a very important skill. It's called compromise. You just can't go at your pace and style. You have to share it with others. As I said, Genesis 2.18 says, it's not good for man to be alone. God hates loneliness. What's his antidote? Well, God's antidote to loneliness is two groups, a physical family and a spiritual family. Physical family is an antidote for loneliness, but even that's not gonna last forever. Family, physical family split up. They, They grow up, they divorce, they move away, they die. But your spiritual family, which is the church, is gonna last forever and ever and ever. Your physical family isn't gonna last forever and ever, but your church family is going to. Hebrews 10, 25 says this, let us not give up the habit of meeting together. Instead, let us encourage one another. That's the comfort and the correction or the, the challenge that I talked about earlier. The church is God's spiritual safety net for you. That when you're, when you're weak, when you're tired, when you feel like giving up, you know, you're created for community. Have you, have you ever said, uh, you know, well, I, I, don't, I don't feel like going to worship. Well, of course you have. You know, I've thought that a lot myself and I was gonna do the sermon. <laughs> when you're tired and you're, you're, you'd rather just stay home and lay on the couch all day. But you know what I've discovered? Is that when I least feel like worship is when I usually need it the most. But when I get with other people, my, my, all my discouragement and my fatigue and all the other things we're gonna talk about, they start leaving, and so does the loneliness. 
I want you to write this down right now somewhere on your outline. Community is God's answer to loneliness. We all need a place to practice relationships and learn to love. Community is God's answer to loneliness. So what you need to do to walk through life is you need a small group of believers. 1 Corinthians 14, 30 and 31, look at this verse. It says, when you gather, each one of you, he's talking about gathering in a small group, because you can't do this in a crowd of 500 or 200 people. You can only do this as a small group. He says, 1 Corinthians 14, 30, 31, when you gather in that small group, each one of you be prepared with something useful for all. Sing a song, teach a lesson, tell a story, lead a prayer, provide an insight, take your turn with no one person taking over. That way you all learn from each other. That could only happen in a small group. What's the goal? The goal of this fellowship is Ephesians 4.16. As each part does its work, it helps the other parts grow so that Christ's whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. I want you to write this down under this next point. I can't grow without others. If I don't have others, I'm gonna be lonely. But this is the second point. I can't grow without others. 1 Peter 4, 9 says, open your homes to each other without complaining. That's called hospitality. Are you doing that? Are you being hospitable? Are you opening your home up to a small group? If you're not in a small group right now, you need to start one. And I'll help you. Just get a couple of friends to discuss what you learn in this series. You say, well, you know, I, I just haven't started small group. I'm not in a small group. Well, let me ask you, be honest. What excuse have been you been using for not being in a small group when you know it would be strengthening for your spiritual heart and your support? What excuse have you been using? Well, you know, my, my, house, my house is not clean or my house isn't big enough or I don't like my neighbors <laughs> or nobody would want to come to my house. Really? You know what the truth is? The truth is everyone has a longing for belonging. Everybody has a longing for a belonging. It's why the worst punishment you can give a person is put them in solitary confinement. Man was not made to live alone. Woman was not made to live alone. And, and we have a longing for belonging. It's one of the reasons why people wear logos. They're trying to identify where they want to belong. So first off, I need a church family. I need others to walk with me. Let me give you a second reason. I need others to work with me. Not just to walk with me but to work with me. And did you know that God has a special work for you to do with your life? Here's what the Bible says, Ephesians 2.10. God made us to do good works. Look at that. You say, why am I alive? God made you to do good works, which he planned in advance for us to live our lives doing. Did you know that before you were born, God planned the good works he wants you to do with your life? You could miss them. You could miss your purpose in life. It's not automatic. Remember, life on earth is to practice for eternity, and one of the four things you're gonna do in heaven is serve God. In heaven, everybody's gonna share the work, so we'll never get tired. But on earth, what happens is we try to do it all ourselves, and the result is fatigue. Now, God tells us why we need to work together. Look at this verse, Ecclesiastes 4.9. Two people are better than one because they get more done, what? Read it with me, working together. Two people are better than one, they get more done by working together. So you need a church family to get the work that God has for your life done. God never meant for you to do it by yourself. You know, one time a few years ago, I was making a tour of the East Coast and I spoke uh, at, at uh, West Point, the, um, the, the uh, Army Academy. I spoke at the Navy Academy too, but at West Point, it's interesting, they have a system there, uh, uh, so impressed me, it feeds 4,000 people Get this, in 15 minutes. So how in the world do you do that? How do you feed 4,000 people in 15 minutes? Everybody has a role. And I noticed that when they were doing this at West Pond, everybody had a role. If sometimes we think that the greatest Christians are out there all by themselves. You know, there's this myth about Mother Teresa that she was out there serving on the streets of Calcutta all by herself. No, she wasn't there. Kay went and served with Mother Teresa a little bit years ago and came back telling me that Mother Teresa has an army of sisters helping. You need other people helping you fulfill the work that God has for your life. And I say it like this, by myself, I can't do a lot. You can't do a lot, but together we can. 
Snowflakes are frail. They're, they're not by themselves. They're not very. They're not very strong. But if enough of snowflakes stick together, they can stop traffic. And together we can make a difference with each person doing a little. So. If you're sitting uh, listening to me today and you say, man, I'm really tired, I'm exhausted, it's probably because you've got nobody helping you. You're missing one of the benefits of being in a small group and really totally connected to a church family. You can attend and not really be connected. I want you to write this down under this point. Community is God's answer to fatigue. Community is God's answer for fatigue. God didn't meant for you to do it on your own. Have you ever watched the Amish build a barn in a day? I once saw a TV show about it. The entire community shows up and they all help. And the Bible says in Galatians 6.10, every time we get the chance, let us work for the benefit of all, starting with the people closest to us in the community of faith. So I need a church family to walk with me and I need a church family to work with me so that I can do the work that God's called me to do. Number three, I need a church family, I need others to watch out for me. Not just to walk with me, to work with me, I need them to watch out for me. In other words, I need people in life, my life who will warn me of traps, who will defend me, who will protect me, who will help me stay on track. The Bible has a lot to say about this. Philippians 2, verse 4 says this. Look out for one another's interests, not just for your own. That's a good thing. That's what a family's all about, what a church family's all about. You know, have you ever seen any of those neighborhood watch signs? It says, you know, there's a neighborhood watch in this area. That's a sign of community. Let me ask you this. When, have you ever left on vacation, and before you left, you asked a neighbor to watch your stuff? while you were gone? Probably. So you've asked neighbors to watch your stuff. Here, let me ask you another question. Have you got anybody watching out for your soul? It's far more important. You may have a neighbor watching your stuff, but who's watching out for your soul? That's part of the family of God. We need other people watching out for us. Why? Because we all have blind spots. There are some things that you need other people to tell you in your life. When you have a tail light out, you can't see it. You need other people. When you're unzipped, you can't see it. When you have lettuce in your teeth, you can't see it. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, verse 1, keep being concerned about each other as the Lord's followers should. Now, notice it says keep being concerned. Keep means you be vigilant. Vigilant, sorry, vigilant. And in a war, everybody takes turn on sentry duty. Somebody's got to be vigilant watching out for the enemy. You know, since 9-11 happened here in the United States, uh, we've had to be vigilant against terrorists and terror attacks. And I just went through a couple airports this week where I had to get scanned because they're being vigilant for the enemy. But did you know that you have an even greater enemy, far greater than the terrorists in the world? And that enemy wants to mess you up. He wants to destroy your life. He's plotting your downfall every morning before you ever wake up. He's thinking how to defeat you with temptations and trials and dead ends and detours. See, Satan fights with an arsenal of habits, and hurts and hangups and problems. And, and much of the time we're defeated, why? Because we're trying to fight him on our own. That's dumb. You need other people helping you resist temptation. Ecclesiastes 4.12 says a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. And there are even the three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. You know, I, when I read that verse, it makes me think about years ago, I, I walked across a prison yard in Northern California with 2,000 convicts, most of them there with life sentences, uh, standing on that field, and I was invited there to speak to them on that prison yard. But you know what? I had no fear. Why? Why did I have no fear? Because 30 Christian inmates were walking with me on every side, in front, behind, on either side, watching every move. I wasn't afraid at all. Let me ask you a very personal question. Is anybody protecting your backside? Who's watching out for you spiritually? Nobody at work's doing that. Nobody at school's doing that. Nobody in the government neighborhood's doing that. You need a church family. You need a small group. 
you know, as a lifeguard, I was a lifeguard for three years. I, I used to tell people, never go swimming by yourself in the ocean. You need to have a buddy, a partner. We're better together. I want you to write this down. Community is God's answer to defeat. The church family, the family of God, is the answer to defeat. Ecclesiastes 4.10, if one person falls, another can reach out and help. But people who are along, alone when they fall, they're in real trouble. Let me, give you, let me give you a couple more. Number four, I need people to, first I need people to, to walk with me and to, to, to watch over me and to work with me. Number four, I need others to wait and weep with me. I need other people in my life to wait with me when I'm going through a tough time and to weep with me. And that's what a church family is all about, to help me through the inevitable crises of life. You say, well, what are you talking about? Well, let me just give you a list of some situations that nobody should ever have to face alone. In other words, nobody should ever have to face waiting in a hospital alone during a risky surgery. Nobody should ever have to wait alone for a lab report or a pregnancy problem. Nobody should have to wait alone for news from a battlefield from a son or a daughter or a father or mother. Nobody should have to, have to wait alone for a coroner while they're identifying a body. Nobody should have to wait alone standing in front of a fresh grave or the first night after your husband or your wife dies or the first night after your husband or wife walks out. I could go on and on, but the fact is things like this will happen in your life eventually. And it's foolish not to have your support network, your support, your safety net in place now. Because at some point, you will have a life-shaking crisis. None of us know what it is or how it's gonna hit us, but the time to prepare is now. And what is God's safety net? It's a group of believers who are committed to you and you are committed to them. Who's committed to you right now? Could you, give me, could you rattle off a name of people who'd be there in an instant? Let me ask you it another way. Who could count on you that if they had a crisis in their life, you would be there in an instant for them? First Peter 3, 8, the first part of the verse says this, you should be like one big family full of sympathy toward each other. And I've told you many times about how my personal small group has helped me through very difficult times and how we've traced all, you know, we've faced all kinds of trauma together. First Corinthians 12, 26 is God's plan for a church family. And it says it like this. If one member suffers, all suffer together. One of our members get cancer, we all ought to care about that. Pray for him, support him. You know, I remember a while back reading a newspaper article about a guy who laid dead in his bed for two years in his home and nobody noticed. Friends, that is tragic. Imagine the spare. No one should ever die alone. I want you to write this down. Community is God's answer to despair. It's God's answer to despair. Romans 15, 12, verse 15. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. That means I need people who wait with me when I'm scared to death and who will watch with me and they'll pray for me and they'll weep with me. You know, the truth is we often don't know how to handle tears. And sometimes you'll be in a small group and somebody starts crying and everybody feels a little awkward. Why are you feeling awkward? Let me give you a little tip. When you're in a small group and somebody tears up, tears are always a sign that it's time to stop and pray. And probably just go over and give them a hug or put a hand on their hand and squeeze their, squeeze their hand. You don't have to fix people's problems, but you do have to be there you have to have the ministry of presence. Sometimes you just need to sit in silence with them and weep with them. The Bible says weep with those who weep. First Thessalonians 5.11 says, you know, you gotta be flexible. It says this, encourage each other and strengthen one another. Well, let me ask you a very personal question. Who do you need to encourage today? Can you think of somebody who might need your encouragement right now? Hmm. Finally, let me give you one more reason why you need the support of a Christian spiritual church family 
in order for spiritual health. I need him to walk with me. I need him to work with me. I need him to watch and wait with me. Okay, I, I need him to just be with me in all the things of life. But the number five, I need others to witness with me. Did you know that God says, I expect you to tell other people about what I've done for you? I, I, did you know that God expects you to fulfill a mission in the world and share your life message, the story of your life with others? Well, God doesn't expect you to do it by yourself. He, he says, I, I need other people to witness with me. And there's great power in group witness. It's very impressive. When people come to Saddleback Church, any of our campuses, and they walk in and they see people w worshiping together, that's a witness. But you know what the greatest witness of your life is to unbelievers? Loving each other. Loving each other. The Bible says, see how they love one another. The Bible says, uh, that that is the essence of our highest witness. What impresses a community the most is our love for each other. John 13, 35, Jesus said it this way. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. If you don't love other members of a church, where are you proving to the world that you're his disciple? This is our goal. This is our goal for this entire series, that your love for each other will prove to the world that you're my disciples. That is our goal. The one thing that proves to the world that you're a follower of Jesus Christ, it's not our buildings, it's not our bumper stickers, it's not our programs, it's our love for each other. First Timothy, one, 2 Timothy 1.7 says this, the Holy Spirit doesn't want you to be afraid of people, but he wants you, wants you to be wise and strong and to love love them and enjoy being with them. That is one of the reasons why God needs us to be in a family so that other people can help us in sharing the good news. You know, I've often asked you, is anybody gonna be in heaven because of you? So I'm asking it again today. Is anybody gonna be in heaven because of you? I wanna help you. And I wanna help you by saying, you don't have to do this on your own. Let's reach your friends, your neighbors, your family members, your relatives. Let's reach the people in your circle and your, your part of the world together. I want you to write this down. God's answer to fear is community. See, you lose your fear when you realize God is near and other people with you, you're just not as much afraid. You know what? I want people to be able to say about this church, Saddleback, but I want God to be able to say it about other churches too that what they, I want God to be able to say about us and other people say about us what was said about the church in Philippi, which was a little city in Greece. And in Philippians chapter one, verse 27, Paul says this about that congregation. He says, you are working together. That's the family of God. And you're struggling side by side to get others to believe the good news. I want that to be said about Saddleback Church, that we're working together, struggling side by side to get others to believe the good news. And here's the bottom line. So let me, let me sum it all up for this weekend. We need each other. You need other believers in a church family and in a small group. And you need them to walk with you, especially through troubles and trials. You need them to work with you as you develop your gifts, your spiritual gifts and your shape. You need them to watch out for you and the traps and the troubles all around. You need them to weep with you when you have losses and you need them to witness with you as together we make a front to the world to say, we are not ashamed to say we love Jesus Christ. Now, I'm, I'm gonna ask you to say something aloud in all 20 campuses. You think I can't hear you, but I can, okay? I want you to say this aloud. So everybody say it, I Okay, some of you did not say it. I see you on the fourth row, okay? I see you and I hear you. Say, I. Okay, everybody, I. Okay, and then repeat this word, really. Say it, really. Really, 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 really. Need a small group. <laughs> Need a small group. You know what that is? You just made the declaration of interdependence. That's the declaration of interdependence. I really, 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 really need a small group. During this series, we're gonna learn how to meet the deepest emotional, spiritual needs of each other, and we're also gonna learn how to have our needs met 
at the same time. Now let me pray for you as we close. Father, it is time for the church to really be the church. Not the kind of church that everybody's heard about. The boring kind, the kind that doesn't meet the needs, that doesn't fulfill the purposes of God. Father, it's time for the church to have a revolution of love and fellowship and community as we are members of the body of Christ together. We're brothers and sisters in the family of God. Please begin this in our hearts today. With all my heart, Lord, I believe that our church and all of our campuses and many, many other churches will start fulfilling God's purposes together. That when we do that, we'll see a new revelation and a new revitalization and a new revival, not just in our church and in other churches, but a spiritual awakening in our nations and in the world. Now you pray. Would you pray? Say something like this. Dear God, forgive me for all the times that I felt I didn't need other people in my life or didn't even need your family, the church. God, I wanna be a part of what you're doing on earth through your family. I, I wanna experience real community and fellowship in my church. I, I'm tired of superficial relationships. I wanna learn to love and be loved in a deeper way. I open up my life to you, Jesus. Thank you for bringing me to this church family. Thank you for a place to belong, a place to grow, a place to fellowship, to serve, to share, to worship. God, I don't wanna be a passive follower or a passive attender anymore. I commit to getting into a small group so I can learn about real community. And please bless our church family as we learn and grow together in the next 48 days. In Jesus' name, amen.